you know everybody felt like january was like a really really long month i must have missed the memo because to me january felt like a normal month i don't know maybe because i was busy <laughs> Hey y'all, it's Ashley Bookishram and I am back with another video today. As you can see by the title, we're here to talk about my January wrap up, which my January wrap up, it everything went really, really well for January. I read some good stuff in January. I actually read a couple of books that had potentials to be favorites of 2021 in January. In January. I think that's absolutely crazy. So as with all my wrap ups, my final wrap ups, we're going to do the stats at the beginning and then we will go through and talk about the books that I read in the second half of the month. But before we get started doing that, I am here to talk a little bit about book of the month. So thank you so much to book of the month for sponsoring this video. If you didn't know book of the month is a fast growing and super popular online book service. Their mission is to promote new and emerging authors to help readers discover books that they love. As I always say and will continue to say which is super important to me as a reader is that book of the month is a very particular and very aware of how they pick their books each and every month. They not only focus on diversity in terms of their authors but also in terms of the books that they choose specifically in genres. Each month there are a wide variety of genres to choose from including mystery, thrillers, nonfiction, contemporary, romance, historical fiction. It's just so much. So the way that it works is that each month the book of the month team spends time going through and vetting hundreds of books in order to create a special curated list of new releases and early release titles. So early release titles meaning that sometimes we do get the opportunity to read books before they are released and this is great because it provides readers with the opportunity to spend less time researching and looking and more time reading. Book of the month is risk-free. You can skip any month at any time and you will not be charged. Plus they have the best prices for new release hardcovers. I don't know about y'all but you know new release hardcovers are really really expensive. I've seen some all the way up to $45 which is just not in my monthly budget and book of the month usually costs only $14.99 a month which is a really really great price for a newly released hardcover. However today I have a code that you can use and that code is FEBREADS and you can get your first book for $9.99. So now let's jump in to the books that are the February picks. Each month your books will come in this blue book of the month box. And if you've been watching me for any length of time you know that I absolutely adore book of the month's bookmarks. This one says <laughs> saved you a spot you know because it <laughs> whoever writes or comes up with these quotes is spot on an amazing individual I just have to say that. So the first one that I see in the box is A Kindness Lie by Nancy Johnson. This one takes place in 2008 I believe right after Obama gets elected and it focuses on a young woman who has left her town of Chicago and she had given birth to a child that she ended up giving up for adoption. She becomes a successful black engineer and she's married and then she decides to return home and visit and that's when her family kind of reminds her about what they had to sacrifice because she lives a very comfortable middle class life and they remind her of everything that she's had to give up and or that they've had to give up in order to make sure that she is living a comfortable lifestyle that she's living right now and she ends up coming across a white boy and then something happens and it throws them into this 
chaotic experience which I'm guessing has to do with some racial tensions that are happening within her hometown and it's specifically I think going to look at those racial tensions and it's interesting because this takes place during 2008 and I feel like in the summary it mentioned a little bit about the financial crisis of 2008 which I think sometimes we forget about but it definitely impacted a lot of people so I'm interested in seeing how the author is going to weave that into the story. The next one that I see is Girl A by Abigail Dean and this one that seems to be a mix of just literary and then also some type of psychological psychological thriller. It deals with a young woman who was known as Child A. So she came from a very tumultuous background and I'm guessing just from the synopsis that this may have a little bit to do with child abuse, having parents who were abusive to their kids and all the kids get out. Her mother ends up in jail and her father never comes back from the part that he had played in this entire situation. But but what ends up happening is that when the mother passes away in jail she actually leaves the house that they lived in which the flap of it is saying that they call it the horror house which I know that that's probably going to be shocking to read about but they were granted the house because it was left in their mother's will and they go back to the house and when they get to the house this is I think when the psychological thriller aspects start happening where they're trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together whether the person that is narrating the book actually has the story right or whether there are some pieces and parts of it that seem to be missing and there seems to be some betrayal among siblings secrets that have been kept from each other and it's a question of who actually technically made it out of that house. So I think that this is going to be a, a difficult read but very very intriguing. The next one that I have here is Infinite Country by Trish Patricia Engel and this is about a young girl by the name Atalia who is at the time of the beginning of this novel is being kept in a facility for an act of violence supposedly and this seems like it's told backwards so not in chronic like it's a flashback so we get to see the parents meet her parents meet each other for the first time how they leave Colombia in the midst of a civil unrest and they make their way to the United States on a temporary visa and then they have more children they when they leave Colombia they've only had one child and when they get to the United States they have two more children Talia included in those second two children and then something happens and deportation occurs. So I'm interested to see how this is going to line up in terms of what events happened that led to the current situation that we as readers are going to get when we start the novel. The next one is The Four Winds by Kristen Hanna. I have read Kristen Hanna before The Nightingale and it was one of my favorite books the year that it was released. A very hard-hitting book so I expect nothing less from this one. This takes place against the backdrop of the Great Depression. We we meet our main character in 1921 right after World War One is over with and she's past the acceptable age for marriage which of course has changed within the 20s you know different circumstances and she's unmarried she meets a man and it's kind of a marriage of convenience. Fast forward to the 1930s during the Great Depression and things are falling apart just not in terms of like the United States and the economy but also her marriage and she's just fighting to keep her children alive. I think that this may have some references to the Dust Bowls as well. So this is probably going to be another hard-hitting book and impactful especially because of the backdrops that it is set against. And the last one that I have that I'm so 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 excited for because I just literally talked about this book in one of my books on my radar videos and that is Honey Girl by Morgan Rogers. So this one is an early release title. I also believe that The Kindest Lie is an early release title as well. And Honey Girl is about a main character by the name of Grace. Grace just gets her PhD. She goes to Vegas to celebrate and she ends up marrying a woman while she's in Vegas. <laughs> and she basically picks up everything and moves to New York with this woman that she doesn't really know a lot about. And I think when they move to New York City they get the chance to know each other better. And this is going to be intriguing because Grace is not 
this type of individual from the character description that we get in the synopsis. It's almost like she's very much so used to having everything in line. So I wonder how she develops as a character when she kind of throws that mentality to the wind and just goes with it. All right y'all so those are the five books for book of the month. Remember that the code that you can use to get your first book for $9.99 is a Feb Reads. I'll make sure that that link is down below in the description box for you to click on as well as the code. Thank you so much to book of the month for sponsoring this video. All right y'all so let's go ahead and jump in and start talking about the books that I read in January. So I ended up reading 35 books in January and they it was a good reading month that's all I can say. I they I don't know it was just a really good reading month. So we're gonna go through we're gonna do the stats really really quick. My stats are a little bit more expansive than what I did last year because there are a couple things that I'm watching myself for in particular this year that I didn't really talk about last year because it was just kind of doing some self-reflection for me and there's some things that I personally wanted to keep track of so my stat section is probably going to be a tad bit longer than what it normally is but this is kind of the format that I'm going to be going with all of 2021. We'll see how it goes and if it doesn't go the way I want it to go then I'll end up changing it for 2022. So as I am saying for like the third fourth fifth time I read 35 books that came to a total of 8,046 pages according to Storygraph. I think it really just depends on what format of the book is listed on whatever site but Storygraph said I read 8,046 pages this month which came out to an average of 260 pages a day. Something new that I've been trying to keep track of which I'm doing through Book Riot's kind of spreadsheet is the number of hours that I spend each month listening to audiobooks. This month I spent 146 hours and 10 minutes listening to audiobooks. It's a lot of freaking time. I think that's something like a little over six days if I did nothing but listen to audiobooks straight. Like nothing every minute every second of the day. In terms of genre I read 15 romances and I actually broke these categories down a little bit more. I read seven contemporary romance, three dark romance, and five historical romances. I read three picture books, three realistic slash contemporary slash literary fiction. I'm just going to keep those three together. Six graphic novel, manga, and comics, one horror, two sci-fi, one historical fiction, two mystery slash thriller, one fantasy, and one nonfiction. Now some of these technically do crossover because I read more than one nonfiction this month but because it may have been in a different format like it was a nonfiction picture book or if it was a nonfiction graphic novel I didn't include it within that category. So that number is definitely not the most precise but I just the parsing of the number thing is just too much so we're just gonna flow with that. In terms of format 16 I listened to on audiobook, 9 I read physical form or print and 10 were ebooks so we're looking at 50, almost about 50-50 not quite but almost 50-50 which is what I, I, I like to see split evenly between print ebook and then audiobook. In terms of target age or age categorization one was young adult which I'm surprised I thought I read more young adult this month and clearly I didn't. Two were middle grade, three were children's and 29 were <laughs> adults. <laughs> So this is definitely not evenly split. I, I really want to see a little bit more balancing of YA middle grade and children together versus adult. I kind of want to see those numbers get a little bit more 50-50 for the rest of the year. In terms of source there's going to be some crossing over so the numbers are not going to equal up to 35. I borrowed 18 from the library. 13 were from my own TBR whether that was physical or digital. One I checked out from Kimmel Kindle Unlimited. Two I listened to through Audible. Three I checked out from Comixology. And five were review copies. Now this is a little bit of a different thing where I'm going to dive a little bit more into the background of my authors because I think that that's something that I haven't been paying much attention to 
but I'm going to start paying more attention to that. So this is probably that extra section that you haven't seen before. 28 of the authors that I read in January were BIPOC, 7 were white. Two of the books I read were written by both women and men together. 25 were written by women, 7 were written by men, and 1 was written by a non-binary author. 6 of the authors identify as queer. This one is tricky for me because I wanted to look at where the authors were from. Some of them now live in the U.S. but I am going off of their place of origin if that makes sense. So 25 of the authors are from the United States, two are from Canada, one was from the UK, one was from India, four were from Japan, one was from Nigeria, and one was from Ghana. Of course the other stats that I look at, same thing as last year, one book was over 500 pages, five books were translated, we love to see good translated numbers here. I didn't reread anything this month so far so everything was brand new. Four of the books that I read had LGBTQIA plus rep in terms of characters and when I look at characters I do not count side characters. I look at rep in terms of our main characters. Two books had disability representation and 16 of the 35 that I read were written by black authors. In terms of dates of publication, two were written in 2005, two were written in 2011, one was written in 2013, one in 2014, one in 2016, two in 2017, five in 2018, four in 2019, 12 in 2020, and five from 2021. So 2020 technically is backlist, but I, for the sake of the, the short period of time that we're looking at now, I won't necessarily count it as backlist, but from 2019 and back, I will say is backlist. So we're looking at almost an even split of new, newer titles and backlist titles, which is a good balance. In terms of rating, I had one that was 2.5 stars, four that were three stars, five that were 3.5 stars, 16 that were four stars, three that were 4.5 stars, and six five-star reads. So six five-star reads in one month is really really good for me and that gave me an average of 3.99 stars for the month of January. All right so for all you stats people I hope you enjoy that. That is I know some people love watching stats other people hate watching stats but you know you, you, you just you gotta love it to some degree. Okay so no lie the camera angle probably changed because I had to get a new like SD card memory stuff but let's go ahead and jump in to the books. I'm going to try to make this as quick as possible but y'all know in certain books I get long-winded as hell so I don't really know what to tell you. Sit back, enjoy it, grab a snack, grab a hot cup of whatever or a cold something or a margarita if you're watching after hours. Well shit if you're watching any time of the day but whatever you feel grab something to help your sustenance as we go through these books. Okay so I did cover the first half of the books that I read in January in my mid-month wrap-up which I will link in the card somewhere above. I will let you know what those books are. The first book was Hazel and Gray by Nick Stone, Apartment 103 by Stephanie Shia, I Am Not Your Number, Imaginary Friend by Stephen Chabotsky, The Drops of God Volume 3, Remote Control by Nettie Okorafor, C is for Country by Lil Nas X, the Initiation by Nikki Sloan, The Obsession by Nikki Sloan, The Awakening of Malcolm X by Ilyasa Shabazz and Tiffany T. Jackson, Chester Nez and the Unbreakable Code by Joseph Brujak, The Drops of God Volume 4, How to Fail at Flirting by Denise Williams, The Deception by Nikki Sloan, The Way the House Husband Volume 2, Crosshairs by Catherine Hernandez which I did a standalone review for, Link that in the card symbol above. They Called Us Enemy by George Take. Goldie Vance and the Hocus Pocus Hoax. That is such a tongue twister by Lilian Rivera. So the first book that I read in the second half of January, I'm actually going to 
take two more books that I read and just include them in one big discussion because they're part of the same series and I read the final three books in the McLean Brothers series by Alexandria House. I have not read the novella which is 4.5 which features the sister's story. I do plan on reading that. I just didn't get to it in January. So I did end up reading the second book which is Let Me Hold You. Then I read Let Me Show You and the last one is Let Me Free You. So if y'all didn't know the McLean Brothers series is a amazing black love romance series that was done by Alexandria House that focuses on these four brothers and each brother has their own individual romance and they have their partners that we get to meet and then brothers show up in each other's books. It's just one of those uh, family romance sagas. These last three focus on Leland, Nolan, and Neil and Nolan and Nolan and Neil are twins. So Leland is an NBA star. His story is an age gap romance and this is Let Me Hold You by the way. His is an age gap romance where he falls in love with our heroine through the community center that she works at and he usually does not get super attached to the women that he is involved with but he just has a preference for older women and in this situation he does get super attached but there are some background issues going on. I wrote a review on this one and I usually don't do spoilers in my reviews on Goodreads. I usually keep them spoiler free just because I know that sometimes people go to look at my reviews before they've read a book. And for this one, I actually had to include a spoiler section because it was the way that it was done with the heroine in terms of her relationship with her son. And it was very, very intriguing. She had, and her name is Kim, by the way. I don't know why I just keep, because I usually have a hard time remembering names. That's why I try to stay away from names because they, they fly out my head like that. But she doesn't get into relationships because she's been in relationships before and they all have been abusive. So it's a content warning for abuse and there are some interesting dynamics that go on with her son that I was it didn't bother me but it kind of did because I am a mom so I don't know and it wasn't anything like sexually graphic or anything like that I don't want anybody to take it like that but and I don't want to spoil it but there was just an element about it that was very just off-putting for me because I think I am a parent so that one still got four stars for me it didn't affect the way in which I viewed the book or my enjoyment of the book but it was just it was harder for me personally to make it through that section but I thought that it was a decent read at this point I was still like a big south and Joe's romance was still my favorite and then I moved on to let me show you which is Nolan's book and Nolan is a movie producer at that point they had a company and well he had a company with his brother and stuff so he ends up meeting Joe's best friend who is the love interest of Big South in the first book and Nolan's story is really interesting because Nolan from the beginning of the book is known for only dating white women and specifically white foreign women and they all were convinced even I was convinced like Nolan doesn't like black women so it was very interesting seeing him have this attraction to a black woman and all throughout the book like all of the other brothers and side characters are like bro you like women like you like black women like that's it's just so strange that you like black women we thought you only like foreign white women and I was I was very very intrigued with the explanation that Alexandria House gave for his reasoning behind dating white women it was very very fascinating and very understandable considering the circumstances and what happened to him in terms of like growing up and how his brothers stardom especially Big South because Big South is a household name in terms of being in like the rap industry and how that impacted him and why he does what he does and for this one I think what I appreciate about it is that there was an emphasis not on an HEA that involved 
marriage and kids. I think that a lot of times when we think HEAs and including myself and when I thought about HEAs and the conclusion to a lot of romance books we think happy ever ever they get married and they have kids and this one was not that way. And I appreciate it that she did that because I think that it's something that we need to see more often for women or just couples who decide like I don't want to have kids like kids are just not in my future and I think still even in 2021 there's this hang up especially towards women who are like I choose not to have kids I just don't want to have kids it doesn't mean that I don't like kids it doesn't mean that I can't appreciate people who have kids or I don't want to be around kids I just don't want kids of my own and respecting that that's their decision that they don't want that responsibility that they have other things that are like their babies in this case we're looking at two individuals who are so career driven that they looked at their careers as their kids doesn't mean that they weren't willing to like babysit nieces and nephews and stuff like that but that was their main focus and that's the aspect of this that I really did enjoy the only thing about this one that, that I had an issue with is that it seemed to be a little off balance meaning that this book heavily focused on our heroine and usually it's not like that in the first first two books there seems to be a balance of issues between our hero and our heroine but in this one it was very unbalanced meaning that there really wasn't much of a conflict on Nolan's part per se and I feel like it led to Nolan not being fully developed as a character in some ways because of the fact that we were so focused on Bridget's issues which were val I mean there was there's a lot going on with Bridget in terms of like her family definitely trigger warning for sexual abuse uh and abuse of a child I think that because we were so focused on that aspect of her life that Nolan's character development just wasn't as thorough I think as it should have been but let's talk about this last one let me free you by Alexandria House and yes I said her name again because this beautiful beautiful woman I thought I was in love with Big South y'all saw me gush over Big South in my top 20 books of 2020 I was all about Big South in 2020 baby 2021 we are all about Neil okay Neil kicked Big South to the curb Neil was just so amazing so throughout the first three books of the series you find out that Neil is in a lot of ways I think a screw up but not really I mean he is but not there's a lot of explanation and reason and why because we only get to see his story from the surface so a lot of what we hear and see is in perspective of how his brothers view him and how he's handled himself in certain situations he appears to have like drinking and gambling issues and we meet Sage in his book so Sage is a close friend of Joe and Bridget who we also meet in the first book we meet her again and she is on the verge of getting deported and in order to save her from getting deported they decide that they're going to do a fake marriage between Neil and Sage. So it is a marriage of convenience. Of course things go well. Things go really really well and we get some background information about why Sage operates the way that she works, why Neil has gotten into so many issues but it's Neil's it's not worshiping but almost like his appreciation for black women. The respect that he has for black women his needs and desires to uplift the black community and you know saying like black women need to be honored we need to have respect for black women and I was like oh Neil Neil for me is like what I would want to see if I was in a partnership with like a black man like this mutual respect and adoration for each other and understanding the position that a lot of black women face living in the United States and Neil's very in touch with that he's very in touch with himself he's very in touch like spiritualism and just being in touch with his awareness of the ancestors it was just oh, it was so good it was so good I am so in love with Neil it's ridiculous so that one got five out of five stars okay so after that I ended up listening to uh, the night swim by Megan Golden and this is one that was getting a lot of buzz last year it is definitely 
a mystery slash thriller. So this one specifically focuses on a main character by the name of Rachel and Rachel is the host of this crime, uh, true crime podcast and she ends up becoming really really popular from it and then she decides to do something different for her third season I believe it is where she actually covers a case as it happens. So she's podcasting as she's following the case step by step and this one takes place in a small town in North Carolina where we are looking at a rape case and the paralleling story is that there is someone who has been trying to get in contact with Rachel to look into a case that is very similar to the case that she's following right now. This person hasn't identified themselves or anything like that. She at first thinks that she's being stalked and she's had issues like that before, but then there are some elements that make her want to take the case on. And for me reading this, it wasn't so much about the twist at the end of it. It definitely was more so about the conversation that was had about rape culture. And there is some territory stories that the author delves into in terms of rape culture that I wasn't necessarily expecting. So of course we get the conversations about how does society view women who have come forward and say that they've been sexually assaulted or raped. We hear a lot of the you know background conversations people saying like you know oh well if she hadn't done this if she wasn't wearing this or she hadn't looked like that or she knew what she was getting herself into she shouldn't have been drinking like you know the 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 common lines that people get when they want to excuse any situation when a woman has become a victim of sexual assault or rape. But another interesting element of this that the author delves into, and I'm not sure if it was intentional or not, is addressing that and recognizing how difficult it is for women A to come forward to begin with and how difficult it is to get on the stand and recount your experience being raped or sexually assaulted. She also delves into a scenario of what if someone is accused and they are innocent and it was very very quick because she just looks at it from perspective of another lawyer who was recounting a case in which someone was accused of rape and sexual assault. They didn't do it. They had to testify but at that point their reputation had already been ruined and they ended up committing suicide because it was their life was pretty much done after that. So I thought that was very intriguing for her to bring that conversation up even if it was just subtly because we are often now used to seeing the narrative of you know believe all women and no one wants to necessarily have that conversation of what if because it's been so hard already for women to come forward that we don't want to create what if situations that prevents women from being able to use their voices but then people will argue if someone is accused and they're not guilty just that accusation alone ruins them but it, it's such a hard balance and conversation to have. I personally am, am a lot of bias towards like believe women when they come forward because it's already hard enough to talk about it but I do understand I think what the author may have been trying to do with that statement but I did enjoy this one. Definitely recommend listening to it on audio because it is told like it is a podcast and I believe that this is narrated by January Lavoie. Partly it's narrated by three people. January Lavoie being one of them who is a very 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 good uh, audiobook narrator. She does great voice acting so I would highly recommend the audiobook version and I ended up giving it four stars. So the next five books I'm going to talk about are books that I read for the historical romance readathon and this was hosted by Jess over at Peace Love Books. Lacey from Lacey Book Lovers and Lisa from Remarkably Lisa. So I decided to challenge myself with reading historical romances that featured two black protagonists. Of course I wasn't able to do this for the group pick but that was my end goal was to 
do that and it was a challenge because I mean I had to look I had to search for some books but I was able to find some interesting titles some for the most part that I really really enjoyed others are were okay so the first one that I ended up reading was A Delicate Affair by Lindsay Evans this is the first book in a series of historical romance books that were written by black authors um, of course featuring black characters and it's called A Journey of African American Romance and it goes through the decades so it's called Decades A Journey A Journey of African American Romance. I looked to make sure I got, the, <laughs> I got the title right. So I think that this one was okay. It focuses on two characters Golden and Leone. I ended up giving this one 3.5 stars. It takes place in the early 1900s and I think what I liked about this one is that with the historical setup and setting you can tell that there was a lot of research done in order to create the perfect setting but the best part of this for me personally was the exploration of black wealth and how that looked in the early 1900s and how that created issues within the black community and just the exploration of black wealth and how that did not bring black people or the black community any closer to whiteness but it does end up causing a rift in the black community so that was a really interesting dy dynamic and what we have is two characters who come from two different economic classes so leone is wealthy she comes from a wealthy family and golden does not he is extremely poor and society and Leone's family in particular don't want to see them together so it's kind of a forbidden romance in in some regard as well but of course they are instantaneously attracted to each other they end up you know spending a lot of time together and there is a bit of a conflict really relating to Leone not or trying to figure out whether she wants to go away to college or not and whether that means that she would leave Golden and this one it does feature a heroine that has to grovel which I think is a little bit of a different element for me because I haven't seen that much I've been seeing it more in some of the stuff that I've been reading but this is like one of three that I've read in the past year that features that element and I really did end up appreciating that I had an issue with the chemistry between the two characters so this is a short book it's just a little over 100 pages but the chemistry between the two characters was just not there which means that their romance ended up just not being what I thought it was going to be and I think I was more interested in the historical aspects than I was in the romantic elements so it fell a little flat for me on that side but like I said I still ended up giving it 3.5 stars. The next one that I ended up reading was His Treasure and this is the first book in the Men of Valor series which I had seen on a blog before and this is a book from an author that is from Nigeria and she wanted to create a romance, historical romance, that focused on black romance that occurred pre-colonization and this was just such a great historical romance. It's about two characters. Our heroine is in a marriage that she says that she doesn't want to be in at all and she says it's simply because of the fact that she wanted to be married to the prince and she got married to the hero instead and she doesn't want to be there so they're married for like a year and he respects her. He's like I'm going to give you your space. I'm going to give you your time. I'm not going to force myself on you. I'm not going to force you to be in my company. Like I'm just waiting for you whenever you're ready and she's determined not to give in and then it changes up because she doesn't change because of this but things start becoming a little awkward when she starts going into the village and people are like you've been married for a year and you have no kids like is your relationship and your marriage actually like a valid marriage because you know for lack of a better term it had been consummated so there is this one particular scene in which there is this buzz of an attraction that was unexpected for her and unexpected for me as a reader and it was insanely hot <laughs> it was insanely hot and it was laugh out loud and I fell in love with the hero because of the fact that he just was very patient because I was at the point I was like man leave <laughs> 
like leave but he decided to stay he wanted to make it work he was so in love with her he was happy to find out that they were going to be betrothed to each other but he did not want to force her into any situation that she didn't want to be in he wanted to wait until she fell in love with him and I thought that it was beautiful it was well written it was funny it it had me fanning myself in some moments and this is a very very short book and there's three of them so I can't wait to see how the rest of the series pans out and I ended up giving this one four out of five stars. The next one that I ended up reading was Scar by Ro Brady, and this one is a newer historical romance that came out at the end of last year and this is a Christian historical romance so there is no you know sex scenes or anything like that it's a clean historical romance i have some feelings about this one i ended up giving it 2.5 stars because i think i get what the author was attempting to do but there was some really weird things that were going on with the plot namely there was a couple of scenes that i felt like went unchecked that shouldn't have gone unchecked especially in relationship to a mother who was not a good mother but I feel like religion was used as a means to excuse her behavior which I don't know if that was something that the author agreed with or if it was just supposed to be a book that was a product of its time like it's it's looking at characters as a product of its time but there was something specifically that happened to our heroine that bothered me a lot because it went unchecked and her internal monologue was that she needed to forgive her mother because it was her mother and I was like no <laughs> absolutely not absolutely not I'm not saying she had to hate her mother but it shouldn't have gone as unchecked as it did I didn't like that there were also some things in terms of the plot that just almost didn't make sense towards the end and the hero and heroine's romance was not logical either this is written as a standalone let me just say that so this is marketed as a standalone but these two characters I believe make an appearance in another book I feel like at that point there should be some type of like precursor that says that you know these characters make an appearance in this book and it might help if you read this book before but I think even in the appearance that they made it was after it would take after it would take place after the events of this book it's just confusing because the romance that they had made no sense it was literally like I looked at you and I'm in love and I was like wait what so I don't I don't know like I said I gave this one 2.5 I'm very actually tempted right now in my thoughts to lower that rating but I think I liked where it was going in terms of like the story and the the setting the timing of it because it was some exploration of like race and stuff like that but characterizing some things and looking at the plot it was just like eh, it just wasn't what I was expecting so that's why I gave it 2.5 stars that was probably a horrible review it's probably the worst review I've done in a very very long time but at the same time I can't really explain this one in depth without spoiling it because it's 52 pages but there was just some things that I just did not care for that I think should have been handled better. I also ended up reading Destiny's Embrace by Beverly Jenkins. This is the first book in the Destiny series. This is not my first Beverly Jenkins book but this is my first historical romance by Beverly, Jen Beverly Jenkins and it was very very good. I ended up giving this one 4.5 stars. This is about Logan and Mariah and Mariah ends up moving out west and she becomes a housemaid-ish type of thing for Logan and they have the banter of all, <laughs> all banters like Logan is very just said like I'm not getting married like forget it his stepmom is like you know Logan you know you should really settle down Logan's like mm, not happening he has mistresses and you know when he sees Mariah he was like dang like this is an attractive woman and Mariah's like mm, 
yeah but you know you get around so this is not finna work type of situation and they are it's hilarious because mariah gets under logan's skin like no other and he just can't seem to understand why but i think what i enjoyed about this like everyone says about beverly jenkins books is that there's a lot of historical information that is woven into the narrative and it's seamlessly woven into the narrative so it doesn't feel like she's info dumping but she sets it up to where her own characters are inquisitive about their surroundings and then there's another character that will step in and actually give them the background and the history of that area which I think is fascinating for us as readers because then we are learning along with our main characters so a lot of the information that we were being you know educated about it was because Mariah was asking certain questions which I did like of course you know they they end up you know working their things out this definitely has some content warnings for abuse by a parental figure for Mariah's character which was the reason why she ended up leaving in the first place her mother was just awful man her mother was completely awful and you can see Mariah kind of have to work through that because she loves her mother but at the same time you know it's like I can't stay and let you kind of just treat me however you want to treat me because that's the way you want to treat me. And the last one that I ended up reading for the historical romance readathon was A Notorious Vow by Joanna Shoup. This is the third book in the 400 series which was the group pick for the historical romance readathon. So this one was interesting. It's about two characters Christina and Oliver. Oliver is a recluse. He has pretty much removed himself from society because he's deaf and it is really a highlight of the book to show how the hard of hearing and deaf community was treated during that time but it's about Christina's journey in moving from the UK to America trying to find a suitor and she is matched up with some very very strange individuals and her parents are awful. I gave this one three stars. The issue that I had with it is that I think that Joanna Shoup wrote Christina to be a little too naive. So she wrote her so naive to the point that she read younger than what she really was which was very awkward considering it's two consenting adults in a relationship and it wasn't like icky or anything but it was just like she was so naive that she read younger and then she was also so naive that the characters that were pinned as antagonists or villains of the story were exaggerated to the point that it was unbelievable like I know that people do some crazy stuff for money and people can be wild when it comes to money which one of the books that I'm going to talk about at the end of this video specifically relates to that but I think that the people who were antagonists in relationship to Christina it was just too out there to the point that it was it left them feeling flat they weren't well developed they were just these extreme characters that were created to help move the plot along and I, I didn't really care for that I can't really speak too much to the representation in the book because of the fact that I'm neither deaf nor hard of hearing I do believe that the author seemingly from what I have seen other reviewers say she's done a good job at trying to reiterate that it is not okay to try to force deaf or hard of hearing individuals to be oral in terms of communication and that is something that is constantly like reiterated throughout the book you know Christina is very adamant about learning sign language to communicate with Oliver so in that respect I, I from what I have seen it has been done well I did love Oliver. I think Oliver is the cinnamon roll of a character. He's really sweet and, and endearing and as hard as he tries to come off I think that he was very kind and patient and caring for Christina and really came to save the day. They end up in a fake marriage of sorts as well or a marriage of convenience on Christina's behalf or for her behalf and he just you know to to do that just to do that was very very sweet of him although of course there was an attraction to Christina. I think their romance was very very good. I loved it. They just were the sweetest 
couple but then we got to the ending of the book which to me felt displaced because I think that the author was attempting to once again make commentary about the purpose of asylums, the purpose of how deaf and hard of hearing individuals were treated, how isolated they were from just the society as a whole but the last bit of it just seemed extremely out of place it was just it was really really out of place so it didn't flow right and I think I knew where she was going with it but because it was so close to the end I was like mm, I yeah this didn't work the way that you wanted it to work so I don't know if I'm going to read the rest of this series in particular I know that she has another series that everyone seems to enjoy but I don't know if I will go back and pick up the first two in this one like I said I gave it three out of five stars and now the best book of 2021. <laughs> Amari and the Night Brothers by B.B. Olsen. I absolutely loved this book. This book was phenomenal y'all. The best. One of the best books of 2021 and it is only January. So this one focuses specifically of course on Amari. Her brother goes missing and no one really wants to talk about it. No one really wants to acknowledge it. They acknowledge it but like she believes that she should still continue to look for her brother which says a lot about what happens when black children go missing in general which is people usually just don't care. After she gets into a little bit of a trouble there is this revelation of a briefcase that has some information in it pertaining to her brother and stuff that happens in a place that she must travel to in order to take part in these challenges and I am intentionally being super super vague with this book because I don't want to give too much away but it's a fantasy it is about a world in which there are other beings, monsters, creatures that exist in the same space as us even though we don't really realize it and there is a particular community that is part of this world in which there are humans who go to school and they become trained to take on different jobs within this community and society and Amari goes there in order to figure out what she needs to do or what she needs to become in order to help find her brother. I think that while that is the at the core of this book like you know that's what gets everything started. Amari looking for her brother it's so much more than that. It's definitely about confidence and perseverance and navigating you know certain experiences while being black and it is a conversation about how not understanding or fear is so closely related to hate which is probably one of my favorite things that B.B. Olsen did with this is recognize that fear often turns into hate. We fear what we don't understand and sometimes that fear turns into hating what we don't understand and that clearly relates to Amari not only because she's black but because of the fact that she's introduced into this world in which she does not know anything about it. She has no background in it and people are infuriated that she gets to be a part of this world. People are intimidated by her experiences, what she turns out to be or what not to be. People just it's it's crazy. It, it was just absolutely just fascinating and in terms of plot okay when I say this book moves fast it moves so freaking fast. So I marked this as currently reading like in November of last year but I truly honestly didn't truly truly pick it up until like maybe right like two days before it was supposed to be published and then I finished it the day after release day and it reads so fast. And then the twist and turns for this book are like what because I thought I had the story figured out that it was boom 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 and I was like wait what 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 it was so crazy it was wild it was such a wild experience but such a good experience such great character development great side characters great discussion the world building just everything about it was just done so well and there are going to be people 
who are going to compare this to the series that shall not be named but y'all we've got to let it go I think that for me and I will never deny that that series was very important for me as a child it was very very important for me as a child I went through some very 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 tough times and that series means a lot to me but I will not carry on that legacy to my child when I know that there are other things out there that are just as good if not better. This is the book that I needed during that time. When I was going through that rough period as a little black girl, I needed this book. This is what I needed. This was what I needed for my soul, my mental health, my spiritual health. Like I needed this book and I'm so happy that this is the type of legacy I can pass on to my daughter. Like this is this is the type of story that I think that she will gain so much from and I'm hoping that people don't run off saying you know trying to make comparisons because I could see it happening because it does create a sense of nostalgia. I would be lying if I said it didn't. But this book stands on its own. It doesn't need any comparisons. It doesn't need to say oh this element's like no. This is a book that was it doesn't need that. It speaks for itself. Phenomenal. Five stars. I'm going to gush about this book all year long. I just want y'all to know that. Just just so you know. So five stars. Five stars. Beautiful tabs. Tabs, tabs, tabs. So the next one that I read was Beloved by Craig Michaels. This is the first book in the Salvation series but technically also the first book in the Belonging duet and then the Salvation series was started by Corinne Michaels which has like seven books and then I think some other authors picked them up or something like something along those lines but this first book focuses on Jackson and Catherine and Catherine has some issues in terms of like abandonment wanting to feel wanted and she has some issues with a past relationship which I don't want to spoil because it does play a role in it and although it happens like in the first like 30 seconds of the book I still don't want to spoil it but she ends up meeting Jackson as a result of trying to move on from that past situation and then it ends up kind of being like a workplace environment type of thing and I thought it was really really cute at first because they were kind of testing those boundaries and they were getting to know each other and I thought that they had great chemistry but then like as the book went on I felt like their emotional issues just got worse and it just became like I want to be with you I don't want to be with you I want to be with you I don't and it was so much back and forth and up and down and all around and I was like okay like are we dealing with teens here like we're we dealing with adults so that was like a bit much towards like the second half of the book the first half I think was really good but the second half failed in character development and it just it blew my mind because it I was like are we you know not saying that we weren't dealing with the same characters because nothing about them changed except their emotional baggage became super intense and the more that they got involved the worse that the emotional baggage got which does happen but I just don't think that I enjoy that aspect of it but the ending was wild <laughs> the the cliffhanger was wild so it was just kind of like a mixed bag of a, of a book it wasn't super consistent in terms of character development and, and plot development but I think that overall it was a decent read I did end up giving it 3.5 stars because I enjoyed the first half so much and really really ate up that ending but that that second part was kind of like what what did, what's going on here like I <laughs> <laughs> but I will be continuing the the rest of the series. After that I ended up reading Ace by Angela Chen which I have been ranting and raving about. I don't know how many more times I can talk about Ace. I had to stop myself from writing a full-blown essay when I did a review for Ace on Goodreads but it was a phenomenal book. It truly was a phenomenal book. Uh, it is a non-fiction book that introduces readers to how asexuality reveals what desire looks like in our community in society at large and Angela Chen lays it out in a very important way and I'm just going to give you a brief 
kind of idea of what she does because I could talk about this book for hours and I may end up needing to do a standalone review for it because it's just that good but for her it's all about understanding the true meaning of words so that people are able to better describe their experiences that's one of the key takeaways of this like something as what would you would think would be simple as defining the difference between sexual attraction and sexual drive and people often group those two things together and they're not the same thing which makes it appear as though people who identify as asexual can't have sexual drive when that's not true so then you get the stereotype that all asexual individuals are sex repulsed and why some people do have that experience everyone doesn't have that experience and it's a book that explains how we as a society view sex and how we often assume that it's what everyone wants to do and that if you don't want to do it then there's something wrong with you. I mean think about it in terms of religion. We are taught in certain sects of religion that you know sexual or, or sex itself the act of sex is something that we all struggle with. It's lust. We have to fight lust and everybody doesn't. <laughs> everybody doesn't do that uh their conversations about how sex has infiltrated politics how if you identify as being more on the left you are free sexually and feminism has often been aligned with being sexually free and if you don't want to have sex you are conservative you know you lean more to the right and that too is not true she goes over the intersections of you know asexuality and disability asexuality and being black asexuality and being a man and how they work together and what that means for the person that is you know facing those intersections it's just a, f a phenomenal book very nuanced very just i mean she did a brilliant job the angela chin herself does identify as asexual however she does make a no note at the beginning stating that she cannot possibly speak for everyone's experience that identifies as asexual but i do know that this book greatly changed my life. It explained a lot of things about myself that I didn't realize. It unraveled a lot of confusion that I think I had about myself and why I handled things the way I did in certain intimate encounters. It has explained to me how it is humanly possible to fall in love with a best friend and literally you can be in love with a friend and it not be sexual in nature. And people seem to think you can't be in love with a friend. You can't have a breakup with a friend but you can and it's all about how we apply those terms and our understandings of those terms and she's very quick to also say like it's not about policing people's language but it's about better understanding language that way that we are able to better describe what we're going through and understand what other people are going through so once again gonna be on my top list for 2021 because wonderful just a masterpiece of a book the next thing that i ended up reading was bride's story by kaoru mori and this is the first book in a manga series that i plan on reading from the library this takes place or is inspired by uh, the surrounding areas on the silk road and it's about a woman who is married off to a certain group and it is an age gap romance. It's a eight year age gap romance and it is arranged marriage. So the, 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 he's, he's a boy. The boy in this book is 12 and she 20 and nothing happens as in like sexual in nature or anything like that. And the age gap is very reminiscent of what actually would have happened during this time period. But our mangaka really sets it up nicely where she almost takes a big sister role. But it is definitely like a cultural exploration. There's not a lot of plot in this. This is more character driven and it looks at just the day to day experiences. But it's heartwarming and charming and very very well done. The art in this is brilliant. I mean the inking you can just tell that the manga just took her time in doing the inking in this book and I just got the second volume from the library I think yesterday so I definitely will be reading that soon and I give this one four stars. Next I read Virtually Yours by Jeremy Holt which I ended up giving three stars to. This is about a 
website that was created in which people can hire someone to fake date them which in theory made sense until you think about like well what if that person's needed in person for like family events and stuff like that so that to me was a uh, kind of a plot hole in some ways but it focuses on two characters one is an ex-child star and the other is a writer that's very focused on her career and she really is not interested in dating at the moment but her family keeps pressing her so she ends up signing up for this virtually yours like dating app and the child star who's our hero is the individual that's on the other end and they spend time getting to know each other and then they end up actually meeting in person but they don't know that they've been talking to each other through the app so it's kind of that weird tropey thing going on there. What was strange for me about this book is that I am very mindful now because of reading Ace like I like to think about the fact like okay like you can fall in love and have romantic interest with your friends and it be platonic but I think that where this one messed up is that it the setup was going beyond a platonic relationship so then when it tried to revert back to that it felt a little disjointed so I think I get what the author was trying to do but then at the same time we didn't because I was like okay so we're building up building up building up and it seems like these two are going to be romantic interests beyond the categorization of friendship but then you're just going to make them friends which to me was just it was weirdly done in that way but I did give it three stars I think that there's some other things that they have out there that I'm going to check out because the artwork and everything was absolutely brilliant. I loved it. But the storyline was just a little bit on the shaky end for me. After that, I read Transcendent Kingdom by Y'all Jesse. This was our Patreon book club pick for the month. We had a great discussion about this book and this is about a family that moves from Ghana to the United States um, and it's told through the narrative of our main character Gifty and it's the storyline is very jumbled up in some ways like it's not a consistent timeline so it's kind of con it can be kind of confusing for some readers I enjoyed it but I know some people may not enjoy those elements necessarily but I did enjoy it but it focuses on Gifty trying to find balance between science and religion when it comes down to it because her mother suffers from depression and uh, she is a suicidal at times and her brother died from a heroin overdose after becoming addicted to Oxycontin and she is trying to understand through both religion and science how that happened and there's nothing that really impacts her in terms of like mental illness and science is not really explaining it and religions also not really explaining it because on the science end she's looking at it in terms of the human brain is is the unknown and we as humans still don't understand why some people for example can take oxycontin and be fine and there are others who take oxycontin and it's like a switch and then addiction starts and no one can figure out what it is that that causes that in some people and not in others even when they are related and she went through a process of not wanting to drink or try drugs or anything like that because she was afraid of the possibility of her you know having to battle her own addictions or deal with mental illness and it bothers her because science can explain that and then she can't understand why coming from a very religious household and having a super religious mom that this is happening to her family. Her family has gone through ab abandonment, poverty, death, and how? <laughs> like why when you know you have people in the family that are extremely religious that believe in God and so it, it's her trying to find that balance. There's also this great conversation about like the black community and mental health and how that conversation is now happening but it hasn't always happened and it's caused a lot of problems a lot of problems for a lot of us and i can specifically attest to that being told to like pray it away and i think that jesse 
did a great job in actually not necessarily taking either side because she points out the flaws in both science and the institution of religion and I think it comes down to people realizing that sometimes you just need that balance between the two and they both will fail at times because neither is perfect so this was good. I, I don't think that I enjoyed this as much as Homegoing and this book in particular, I stated it in my review as well that it's not going to have universal appeal like Homegoing and I think that it's going to appeal or has appeal to a very particular audience but I enjoyed it but I think Homegoing for me personally was the better of the two even though as you can see like I had a lot of thoughts about this one and it spoke to a lot of things that I'm familiar with. Okay y'all we're almost done. The second to last book that I read this month was Take a Hint Danny Brown by Talia Hibbert. This is the second book in the Brown Sisters series which is uh everybody knows about this series so I don't really need to talk about this one that much because I feel like everybody knows what this is about. I gave this one 4.5 stars. This focuses on Danica Brown and Zaf and I actually ended up liking this one better than Get a Life Chloe Brown. I think just because I liked Zaf as a love interest better. He was very sweet. He was compassionate he read romance books he had this pining for Danica which I was not expecting but he cared about her from the jump he really was invested in her he really cared about her he fell in love with her before she fell in love with him and he was patient with her because Danica was very like I'm not going to get into a relationship with anybody like I don't do relationships like I'm very focused on my work and Zaf taught her the importance of having balance and that meant a lot to me personally I think because I have been in situations like that where I'm like work 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 and it's like no you just having some sort of balance is extremely important. Of course this has great representation. Danny is bisexual and is also a practicing witch. I think that this has great conversations about mental illness specifically related to anxiety and depression. The element that I loved in this one more than in Get Alive Chloe Brown is the development of the side characters. So we saw the sisters in the first book in Get Alive Chloe Brown but I think that what we saw in this one in terms of side characters in both of our main characters was chef's kiss. It was really really good. They were so supportive. I think that each of them meaning Danica and Zav had to work out their issues on their own and it was great to see them kind of bouncing things off of people that were really really close to them. Of course we get to see Chloe and Red from the first book but I just think that the side characters really did a heck of a job in this one and I'm excited to see what she's going to do with the third one which comes out this year. And the last book that I ended up meeting, reading in January was a translated book from India and that is Gacha Guchar and this one it takes place in Bangalore and it is about a family that acquires wealth. <laughs> so it starts with this guy in a coffee shop and he's just kind of looking you know around at his surroundings and then he starts to backtrack on his family's life and how they went from being impoverished and living very very simple lives but being very very close-knit to attaining some level of wealth and then things just go haywire from there and there was and I'm going to read you the quote because there's so much that I don't want to say about this book because I listened to this on audio and I listened to the ending of it a couple of times because you don't really understand what this this short novella is essentially a novella you don't understand what it's about until you get to that last section of the book and the quote that I think describes this book accurately and perfectly is it's not we who control money it's the money that controls us when there's only a little it behaves meekly when it grows it becomes brash and has its way with us and that is true that is so true about this book you see this entire family I mean just change and what's so interesting is that on the inside they don't see it but you as a reader you see these drastic changes and our narrator's wife Anita 
when she comes into the picture she sees it too there's some things there that are a problem with her being able to see the issues that they have so I hate that I can't really tell you more about this one because you really just need to go into it blind. There's a meaning behind the the title Gacha Guchar, but I would advise you not to look it up because when you get to the end, you'll understand not only the purpose of the entire thing, but also that title. So <laughs> I give this one four stars. It was it was a fantastic translated work. I'm so happy that I made the decision to read it and that it was the last book that I read in January because I ended January on a good note by reading that and was absolutely mind blown by the ending. So uh, definitely check that one out. <laughs> All right, y'all. So that is my long wrap up. My wrap ups are just gonna have to be long, y'all. I think just because I go into my stuff in depth and it's just within my nature. I can't help it. It is what it is. So if you made it to the end, I really appreciate you. Let me know what your favorite book of January was. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you want to see more content from me, click the subscribe button, hit the bell for notifications. Looking for ways to support my channel, links are down below in the description box. Looking for ways to follow me on social media, they'll be down in the description box as well. And I'll be back with another video soon. Bye.